And I talk about the blackouts. This is not a blackout, right? We still have power. We still have a uh, camera that's running. We still have um, a projector that is going. <clears throat> My name is Richard Toll, I'm one of the professors here at the economics department. Um, you will meet me again in the third year. Uh, I teach environmental economics and climate economics uh, as an option in the third year. Um, but as a sort of introduction to myself, uh, as well as an introduction to economics and more generally what you can do with it, uh, I'm speaking here as well and I'm going to talk about uh, the coming uh, blackouts. Um, this is a headline from uh, the Telegraph uh, just a few weeks ago. Blackout risk rises as UK energy crisis deepens. Uh, that was the Telegraph. The um, BBC reported on the same thing. UK power supply is enough for winter, says National Grid. They're both reporting on the same uh, report that was released uh, the day before by the National Grid. That's the organization that is responsible for the wiring uh, of electricity in this country. Um, and then later on there was a sort of a feedback from uh, some green organizations that said, no, 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 this risk is completely overstated. Um, mostly because they found that in the past, the causes that essentially national grid caused, identified a number of causes as to why the lights may go out this winter. And then the green lobby sort of came back and said, yeah, no, no, but in the past, lights went out for different reasons, so this cannot be true. So that is just logical nonsense. Um, both the BBC and uh, the Telegraph are right. Uh, we don't quite know uh, what will happen uh, this winter. Uh, we do know that the risk of blackouts uh, is actually uh, much greater than we would normally deem uh, acceptable. And they actually have gone up again uh, this winter. I inserted this lecture in this series uh, for the first time last year um, following uh, a fire at a uh, power plant. Power plants typically have fire, but this was an uncontrolled fire. Um, and then um, some uh, issues with one of the nuclear power plants that we have that had to uh, shut it down, and then a fire at another uh, coal-fired power plant, again uncontrolled, uh, and another nuclear power plant that had to be shut down because something was wrong. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, um, and at that time, it looked pretty hairy. Uh, what would happen uh, last winter. Fortunately, it was a very mild winter, it was a very light winter, and we used about one standard deviation below the expected uh, peak electricity. Um, but for this year, um, we, or this winter, uh, we should again be worried, and again, you should make sure that you've stocked enough uh, candles uh, and torches, and batteries for torches, uh, in your uh, houses, uh, because there is a risk uh, of uh, a blackout. And that is what is given here in um, the top graph in uh, dark blue uh, and in uh, light blue. Prediction is always hard, always comes with a margin. The uh, national grid and Ofgem, uh, Ofgem is the regulator, national grid is the one that operates uh, the system, reckon that this winter somewhere between two and 10 hours, we will be without electricity for the simple reason that we don't generate enough electricity. The standard that is imposed on these organizations by parliament uh, is that we should allow this for three hours per year, and chances are we will uh, exceed that. The risk um, of such blackouts will go up uh, in the winter after, and then hopefully uh, by 2017, um, we will have a few more power plants uh, installed that can mitigate uh, this risk. Um, the reason that the risk is so low is shown in the bottom graph. Um, they've taken 
special measures called SBR and DSBR. So essentially, we invested a few hundred million pounds in buying diesel generators to help us. Uh, so these are uh, emergency measures, actually generate a lot of air pollution, um, that help us uh, keep the risk to uh, a minimum. About 200 million uh, pounds was spent on this. Um, the top graph here, you're looking at what we now think is the generation capacity um, for the coming months, uh, split up by fuel. So you see uh, nuclear at the bottom, that's uh, pretty reliable, that they'll keep running. Uh, then you see a lot of wind uh, in there, you see the coal, you see the biomass, you see the pump storage, you see the gas, that's CC, CCGT and OCGT. Uh, you see the interconnectors and then you see the emergency measures uh, all the way uh, on top. So our generating capacity is about 78 um, gigawatts. Uh, without the emergency measures, it would be uh, about two lower. Without the interconnectors, well, the assumption here is that we will get electricity from France and the Netherlands and Ireland that these places will not have a shortage of electricity, but a surplus of electricity that they will send to us. Of course, if they have a shortage of electricity, that uh, pink bar disappears. And if we start delivering that electricity that they need to them, the big pink bar becomes negative, and uh, we don't have quite the 78 uh, that is displayed here. Uh, and also, the wing that is shown here is the average wing. Uh, and that is about, uh, as you can see, 12 uh, gig. Um, if the wind doesn't blow, it disappears. If the wind blows very hard, that uh, 12 actually becomes 120. So if the wind blows, don't worry about the lights going out. We have plenty of electricity then. But in those cold, and still times when the consumption of electricity is quite high because everybody's using uh, running the secondary heating and people are keeping the lights on to feel a bit warmer but it is wind still outside there's no wind then uh, we actually are losing that 12 and then all of a sudden we don't have the capacity of 60 uh, 78 but of uh, 60 uh, six, which is much lower. Um, now, the demand, the peak demand is given in the uh, graph below, has been steadily falling over time. Uh, we, of course, don't know what it will be uh, this winter. They expect a slight uptick because uh, the economy has started growing again. There's a lot of uncertainty about this. It has to do with the wind, it has to do with the light, uh, has to do with the cold. Um, and a lot of uh, inexplicable factors. Uh, they now reckon that we probably will need something like 53 gig, that's the maximum demand, probably in the week before Christmas when everybody's having parties and people have started cooking their turkey and all the Christmas lights are on and it is very dark outside and it is very cold outside, right? That is probably when uh, demand will peak and in that week they now reckon it's 53. If you compare the 53 to the 78 that we have there, you think there is no problem. But of course, if you take away the wind, the interconnector doesn't work because it's also cold and dark and there's no wind in Ireland. Um, or if we have another fire uh, in one of our uh, power plants, then all of a sudden that 78 seems awfully close to the expected peak demand uh, of uh, 53. And of course that prediction may be wrong and we may go for 55, right? And we've been there uh, in the past. Um, and that explains why uh, there is uh, a very reasonable chance that at some point this winter, and even more likely next winter, the lights will go out. Not because of some sort of fault in a, in a power transmission line, but simply because we do not generate enough electricity. Um, we may hope that this is a brownout, the difference between a brownout and a blackout is that a blackout is unexpected. 
If all of a sudden power plants go out or a line trips, then you get all sorts of ripple effects through your grids and that may knock out other lines and you do can do real damage uh, to your power lines and even to your power generators. Uh, if that happens, uh, you're in for uh, a longer period uh, of problems with your electricity, uh, but hopefully they will see it coming and start switching off parts of the country, right? Um, and they see this coming, so they actually have by now proper protocols of which parts of the country to switch off uh, first, which uh, are actually <coughs> households, right? Hospitals will go last, all people's homes will go last, but student housing, ah, who cares, right? Um, <clears throat> so the question I'm going to talk about uh, for the next uh, 30, 35 minutes or so, or so is how did we end up here in the first place? And sort of these blackouts, these brownouts, simple shortage of electricity, that is something that we associate with less developed countries. That is something you, that is common in Nigeria, that is common in the Lebanon, uh, that happens all the time in Pakistan. This is the United Kingdom, right? This is the country that first industrialized. How did we end up here? Um, in order to answer this question, you actually need to know a lot about electricity and the way it's organized. Uh, so that is where I'm going to start. Um, a fundamental point in electricity and electricity supply and demand is that at the moment electricity cannot be stored. Not economically. You can of course stick electricity in a battery, but batteries are good for storing a little bit of electricity for a long time. They're not very good at storing a lot of electricity for a short time. Um, so for all uh, purposes, uh, electricity cannot really be stored. And that means that the way we normally think about a market is wrong if you think about electricity. Because if you're talking about the supply and demand for peanut butter, supply and demand do not meet every minute. You can store peanut butter in a jar in your fridge or in a cupboard. Supermarkets can store peanut butter uh, on their shelves. Warehouses can store boxes uh, of jars of peanut butter for a long time. It does not spoil very rapidly. So the demand and supply of peanut butter do not need to meet at every instant. That is not true for electricity. What we demand at the moment has to be generated at this moment, right? Um, now, electricity is generated by temperamental machines and it's transmitted through temperamental uh, transmission lines and things go wrong all the time. And that means that besides the G electricity that we use, we always generate extra electricity. We always generate more electricity uh, than we need. That is called the spinning reserve that is running in the background and it's essentially sent into the ground, right? It's not used by anybody. Um, but that comes at a cost because people are burning real fuel to make this electricity. They're not selling it because it's not bought. And that means that these people that do this have to be compensated in some way. And the way this is regulated in the market is as follows. Um, that every power generator pays a small tax, essentially, to the national grid, to the uh, coordinator uh, of this market. Uh, and then the national grid buys this reserve power in an auction. Right? That is how that works. Um, there's other issues uh, with electricity markets. We typically think, or I typically think of electricity as electrons marching up and down uh, the wire. You can also think of electricity as waves. 
And if two waves meet, wave coming down this wire, wave coming down this wire, and they sort of meet in the middle and uh, join, to get join forces in a new wire, if that is not coordinated, you can get all sorts of in inference between the two waves. This is so-called frequency regulation, is what is needed to make sure that different po power generators produce electricity of the same wavelength so that you can avoid inference on uh, the web, uh, on the grid, sorry. Um, so that requires coordination. And the way this is done in smaller systems like the UK's or England and Wales, I should say, is that the regulator tells power generators at what speed their generator should spin. And you've probably seen that with wind turbines. If you look at a wind park, they all turn at the same speed. That is coordination, that is not coincidence. If you could see all gas turbines in the country, you would notice that they're all spinning at the same speed, right? So that is another form of regulation that you must have in this market. Um, and there's other reasons to regulate this market, and uh, uh, an important one uh, of them is that the electricity grid itself is a natural monopoly and power generators are quite big relative to uh, the size of the system as, and companies are bigger still uh, so that you actually have issues with market power as well that you need to control. So the power market is and should be heavily regulated. If you just leave this to the free market you will not get uh, electricity much. Um, <clears throat> the way the spot market works, where we immediately trade electricity, um, is best visualized, I think, through so-called merit curves. Um, and you see uh, two examples here. Uh, to start with the left, essentially what you have is that you have very cheap sources of electricity cheap sources in terms of variable cost. Uh, and wind is the cheapest because the wind blows for free. All the cost for wind generation is fixed cost. It's in the capital, it's not in the variable cost because the fuel comes for free. And um, nuclear, same story. So they can generate electricity at a very low marginal cost. Uh, and then as you move up the merit curve, uh, you see more and more expensive sources uh, of electricity uh, come into play. Then we have a demand curve, uh, uh, which is typically um, fairly steep, uh, and then uh, where demand meets uh, supply uh, is where the price uh, settles. Uh, and then the demand curve, of course, varies over time. As it gets darker, people start turning on their lights. Uh, as it gets colder, secondary heating kicks in, and so on and so forth. As people go to the office, uh, turn on their computers. Uh, electricity demand goes up, uh, and so on and so forth. So demand uh, shifts all the time, and that means that you're moving up and down uh, the merit curve. And the wholesale spot price of electricity varies from minute to minute to minute. Of course, the price you guys pay for electricity is fixed throughout uh, the year, or sometimes you have a time of day uh, term. Um, the implication of this is that the price settles somewhere up the merit curve. And that means that the companies that supply electricity at the bottom, uh, at the left-hand side of the merit curve, they make loads of money. Because for them, generating electricity is cheap, and they sell it at a much higher price. Uh, so the base load guys uh, are in the money. Uh, the mid-merit ones, somewhere in the middle, they make a little bit of money. Uh, but then the marginal plant, the one that sets the price, sells electricity at cost. That is, they're not making any money in the short run. Um, and what's more, if you're at the top of this curve, and uh, let's move to the right, if you're at the top of the curve, you're only called upon every so often. 
And as I said, peak demand is probably will fall in the week before Christmas, between 5 and 7 on the first day. That means that there's somewhere in the country a power plant that runs for three hours per year. And in those three hours, actually gets paid exactly at cost. So they're not making any money whatsoever, right? Um, so there's no private incentive to supply this. Um, the Californians have tried uh, to do this through the free market and sort of said, let's just try and see what happens and we're just going to drive up uh, the price of electricity to such an amount uh, that those peak plants would be compensated, that in those few hours that they're running they can actually make their money for the entire year. And it turned out that the people in California were not too happy with electricity sometimes being two cents per kilowatt hour and sometimes being $10,000 per kilowatt hour. That did not go down very well uh, and actually that 10,000 wasn't enough to compensate uh, the peakers. And so they suffered extremely variable and occasionally very, very high prices for electricity and suffered blackouts at the same time. So that does not work. Um, here in England and Wales and Scotland uh, and Northern Ireland are different, or I should say Ireland uh, is different. Um, we try to work this out through so-called bilateral contracts, where the idea is that the electricity retailers and the electricity generators uh, have this sort of long-term deal with one another bilaterally, confidentially, um, and because it's a long-term contract, there's sort of the issues with if there's not enough electricity and it would be blackout, this would sort of reflect badly on both companies in this deal and the public would sort of go after them uh, and therefore they would make sure that there's always enough capacity. This is a, a market that works well in theory and doesn't work so well in practice. Uh, as uh, I've argued uh, in the beginning, we don't have enough capacity um, on this island. Um, it's a bit unfortunate that this happens. Um, when the electricity market was liberalized, they appointed an academic as the first uh, regulator who had sort of written a number of learned papers about these things and said, yeah, this market could work, let's try. And Politicians sort of agreed to this grand experiment, uh, but unfortunately when it became clear that it didn't quite work, politicians sort of lost interest in uh, reforming the market because it was sort of clear that there were problems, but the problems were stored up for months, months later. So after the election, after next, so why should we care? And we stuck to this experimental design much longer. Elsewhere, Capacity is provided in a different way, the same as reserve capacity. That is, everybody pays a tax on generating electricity. That tax is put into a pot, and the national grid buys capacity uh, in an auction. And we're simply paying people, companies, to be there with their power generators just in case. We're not doing much. A bunch of engineers walking through the plant making sure that the machine works. But a lot of these machines actually never work. They we never turn them on. We just paying people to be there just in case. Right? Uh, that is how uh, people uh, outside of this country uh, have solved this. The EU, Brussels, has told in no uncertain terms um, the national grid and Ofgem uh, to follow uh, the example of markets elsewhere. So we're gradually uh, moving in that direction, but then they thought they could get away on the cheap. Um, so the capacity payments aren't quite as high as they should be. Um, <clears throat> the problems of electricity supply are exacerbated by environmental policy. The 
strong subsidies for wind and solar means that the bottom of the merit curve is getting ever wider, which means that the cost of electricity uh, or the price of electricity is lower uh, than it otherwise would be. Uh, this essentially what you're asking the coal and the gas uh, powered plants is to compete with a zero cost supplier and that's taking away their profit and therefore taking away uh, their incentives to maintain their plants to build new plants. This would be no problem if wind was reliable, if we would li live in a place where there is always wind. And even though it sometimes feels like that, it is not true. There are days without wind also in England. And by essentially outcompeting the reliable sources, uh, wind has a, a negative effect on the security of uh, electricity supply simply makes it uh, unattractive. There's another bit of environmental policy that is uh, out there. You should ask your parents about this. In the 1970s, we worried about acid rain. Those problems are basically gone from Europe. But we are now closing our old coal-fired power plants to solve this problem. And because we are closing these plants, and at the same time, there's no good reason to build new power plants for a private investor uh, in this country. We are essentially running down uh, our uh, supply of electricity. Um, because there's no good reason to invest, essentially what companies have been doing is sweating their assets, right? Minimum maintenance, maximum uh, short-term uh, profits. The regulator that is who is supposed to look at all these things has basically been caught napping uh, at uh, the wheel. Um, regulators paid a lot of attention to wind, uh, a bit to solar, a lot of attention to nuclear. Um, last winter, uh, as I said, demand was about one standard deviation lower uh, than we, what we had expected. Uh, there was a lot of focus uh, on interruptible supply contract, contracts. It does not affect private households, uh, so it's not something that they can't talk to you about, uh, but it does affect companies that use a lot of electricity. Uh, so they have a deal with Tesco, for instance, and what the deal says is that if Tesco gets a telephone call or rather uh, an email or an electronic signal from uh, the national grid that we're running out of electricity, and Tesco turns up the temperature in its fridges uh, and freezers. And they are big, right? And they use a lot of electricity. That is fine, right? I mean, if your fridge goes off for an hour or so, then the food in there doesn't spoil. So this is perfectly fine from a food safety perspective. Um, they also have a similar contract with uh, the guys who pump your sewage. Again, if sewage sort of accumulates for an hour or so in the sewer system, that is not a big deal. And then after an hour, you turn the pumps up again, uh, on again, and start uh, uh, pushing out all the shit. Um, that's all <coughs> fine, right? And that is sort of you shift the demand from the peak hour to the hour after, <coughs> and you take away the peak in demand by turning off non-essential uh, demand for electricity. In the future, you will have uh, a smart meter in your house that will talk to your smart fridge and your smart television, and indeed, then a computer will turn off your non-essential electricity use as well. But we're not uh, there yet. That's something probably um, in 10 years or so uh, that will be commonplace, but not quite quite yet. So that is what they focused on rather than fixing the basic problem. There is not enough, uh, <clears throat> not enough investment uh, in the market. Uh, and then this summer, <clears throat> they started panic buying diesel generators 
uh, to make sure that the lights, <laughs> to increase the chance that the lights will stay on. Um, so that is what the regulator uh, has done. The, the government in this uh, is not entirely uh, without blame. Uh, you cannot just say, well, the regulator messed up or the companies messed up. Um, and that is what I'll be talking about for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, <clears throat> when Ed Miliband was uh, the Secretary for Energy, uh, he turned around and said, we're going to build 10 nuclear power plants uh, by 2020. And some of us um, in the know uh, almost fell off our chairs. Uh, how are you going to do that, Ed? Um, if you're looking at here, are the number of uh, worldwide uh, nuclear power plants uh, that, that were ever built in uh, every year from a few years ago to uh, the start of the nuclear area. And what you see is that 10 in 10 years' time is actually a very large number. Um, <coughs> these are the nuclear power plants currently under construction. Um, so India. Uh, is fairly ambitious, it wants to build seven. Korea is fairly ambitious, it wants to build four. Um, <coughs> Finland, France are building one, and then at Meliband is gonna build 10. Um, which would sort of make the UK sort of one of the biggest uh, consumers of nuclear technology uh, in the world in one go, right? And in a very short uh, period. Um, this is, a pipe dream, right? You want to build it, a, a crucial bit of a nuclear power plant is that you need a nuclear vessel. There is this is essentially a big steel contraption, precision uh, engineering at scale, very very large. There is one company in the world that can make these things, and that company has a waiting list of 15 years. So in 2005, you're going to say, I'm going to build 10 of these things, then, and they need to be finished by 2020, then you better have put your order in in the year 2000, right? Nuclear power plants need a lot of planning permissions and so on and so forth. Probably just getting planning permission for a nuclear power plant in this country is going to take 10 years or so. <coughs> All the nuclear power plants that are being built in Europe uh, are hopelessly delayed, typically by 10 or 15 years from sort of the initial announcement, actually from the start, the time they start building, not the time they got permission, they, they applied for permission. I mean, the, the, the plant uh, that they're now building in Finland and another one in, in France, they sort of initially hoped to have this thing up by 2011 and 2012, respectively, but they're now talking about 2020. These things come with hopeless delays, right? Uh, so the idea that you could do 10 uh, uh, within a decade and a half is just infeasible. Another big problem, and that is that nuclear is your ultimate base load. The best way to run a nuclear power plant is, is to run it steadily and generate a constant stream of electricity. And if you mix it with wind that goes up and down and up and down and up and down, you run into problems. If you have wind that goes up and down and up and down and up and down, you want to have gas. Because a gas turbine, you can just crank up and crank down and crank down without damaging the machine. With nuclear, you can't. So nuclear and wind uh, simply uh, don't uh, mix. There's further problems with, with uh, nuclear. Uh, <coughs> so this whole plan was uh, dreamt up by the Labour government, then the coalition government uh, took over. Uh, they changed the policy a little bit. Essentially, um, <coughs> essentially what they said is, yeah, 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 we still want this, but we're not going to pay any subsidies. And the nuclear industry did not believe them. Um, but they insisted we're going to do zero subsidies, so one company walks away, right? We're not going to pay a subsidy, we're not going to build anything. And that sort of continued until there was only one company left at the negotiating table, Electricité de France, which is state-owned and therefore can have sort of a long-term perspective on things, 
because they have all these capital guarantees and uh, secure jobs and what have you. Um, so in the end, in the beginning of these negotiations between the government and the potential nuclear suppliers, it was essentially a buyer's market, right? There was one buyer and there were about 10 potential suppliers. At the end, there was only one potential supplier and then the government had to choose between either losing face or giving in to the one supplier. And they went for the one supplier, they gave in. The price that is negotiated for the electricity from Hinkley C is five times the retail price, guaranteed. You guys pay about uh, 13, cents, 13 pence per kilowatt hour for your electricity. Electricity de France will get 60 pence per kilowatt hour for the stuff that they generate. Right? This is the most expensive electricity in uh, the world, uh, almost. Very, absolutely brilliant negotiating strategy of Electricité de France, I must say. Um, not so clever from our dear leaders. Um, <clears throat> but because so much political capital has been invested in this, they do not dare walk away. Uh, and they're talking about doing this twice again. Um, now I talked a little bit about uh, the government already. Um, I made the point in the beginning uh, that the power market is heavily regulated and it has to be heavily regulated. Um, that immediately means that if you're an investor in power generation or in any other aspect uh, of electricity <laughs> supply, that means that your expected profits, your future profits, depends heavily on whatever regulation that there might be in the future. Right? That follows immediately. Um, so essentially what you're doing is, if you're investing in electricity, you're making a punt on future regulation, on future politicians and what they're going to do. Um, We call this regulatory uncertainty, and if regulatory uncertainty is too high, then the risks of investments are simply too high and you don't invest or you invest elsewhere where uh, uncertainty is lower. And, and recently uh, an oil executive uh, said that they would rather work in Venezuela than in the United Kingdom because Chavez and Maduro are just so much more predictable than the people you see here at the bottom, some of whom you recognize, some of whom you probably don't recognize as the Secretary of Energy, right? But you sort of see that perhaps they use this ministerial post to get a step up uh, to further power, right? Um, these are not people who actually know much about uh, this industry, yet they are in charge. Um, Will the lights go out? I don't know. I think the chance is uh, too high and we did buy uh, our candles uh, and our torches and the batteries. Um, in the meantime, political attention has been completely elsewhere. And over the last two years or so, there's been a lot of attention in the press about price gouging. And whether or not we get a good deal from uh, our uh, retailers. Um, <clears throat> now what you're looking at here is the breakdown of the household electricity bill. <coughs> Half of it is just the fuel cost, and then there's the cost of the network, and then there's environmental taxes, which are much lower than a lot of people seem to think, that's the small blue bit. Um, then uh, there's the costs of the uh, power generators uh, themselves, there's VAT, and then the tiny slice in green, <coughs> that is the profit, which immediately suggests that this is not a market where you find price gouging, right? This is simply the breakdown of the costs uh, and the price suggests that this is a fairly competitive market. Um, Returns of investment in this industry are 45 percent, not particularly high. And if you just look at the structure of the market, there's six large players, if you believe Tyrol, 
then 6 is almost the same as uh, infinity, so it's an almost perfect market. If you have an uh, oligopoly with 6 players, you're very close to the perfect market. Besides the 6 big ones, there's many small ones, and uh, there's actually very easy entry into this market. <coughs> so it's not that we have a large concentration of supply, uh, uh, a large concentration at the supply side. Um, <coughs> But this is not to say that the retail market is perfect. The big issue here is switching. Everybody is free to switch their contracts, but very few people do. And particularly people who are less educated and people who are somewhat uh, older uh, are greatly uh, hesitant to switch supplier. They'd rather stick with the devil they know. Um, and frankly, I mean, our electricity company sends us a letter every year, if you don't do anything, we will automatically renew your contract. And then I think, I don't have to do anything, right? So people stick with the same supplier, and that of course makes them vulnerable to uh, paying a price that is higher uh, than they need to. Um, the government has recognized this problem, but has not really paid attention to what the solution of the problem, uh, to what solutions to the problems there might be. <coughs> For instance, uh, the Labour government again uh, forbade price discrimination. It said everybody has to pay the same price. All your clients have to pay the same price which meant that the companies were forced to take away those sort of discounts that you get for the first year. If you join a new supplier, they were told you can't do that anymore, which of course means that people have less of a reason to change supplier. Uh, less competition, higher prices. <coughs> Previous government, and this was actually Cameron, um, ordained that there can be four tariffs only per company so that it becomes the market becomes more transparent the issue was not so much transparency of the market and now we have about 20 25 potential suppliers of electricity in this country they all offer you four tariffs so in order to find the best deal you still need to trail through 80 to 100 different tariffs, so the market hasn't really increased in transparency by this measure. But what the companies did do is take away the niche products for strange people who only work at night uh, and sleep at day, for instance. <coughs> those special deals for those people, which are actually very lucrative for the companies, um, have gone. Um, for a while, Cameron threatened uh, that everybody should be put on the lowest tariffs. don't think this has been implemented, but as soon as he said this on telly, the next day companies started withdrawing the lowest tariffs that they offered, because if we're going to put people on the lowest tariff, we're going to make sure that that lowest tariff is pretty high, right? Um, when Labour, in the run-up to the election, promised to freeze retail prices, People started raising their prices just in case they would be frozen, right? <clears throat> so government interventions here are not, I mean, they're well intended, but they do not display a great deal of intelligence uh, about how uh, the market really works. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm almost there. Uh, who is the guy on the left? Come on. Exactly, the governor of the Bank of England. Who is the guy on the right? Guy on the right you have never seen before. His name is Dermot Nolan. He's a very nice guy. He also is, has the same position as Mark Carney. He is the independent regulator of our electricity. He's the head of Ofgen. Um, as far as I know, he's never been on television. Uh, I've never seen a headline with Nolan said, um, whereas you see headlines about Carney all the time. So what is the difference between the two? Um, Carney 
profession professionally very well regarded, very powerful individual. He is the governor of a government agency that is completely independent of the government. And if Osborne does something stupid, Carney does not hesitate to go to the press and say, don't listen to that fool, right? I'm going to ignore him, right? And Carney has the statutory power as well as the standing to do that. Dermot Nolan also has the statutory power to do that. But you've never seen him do it, right? He has never gone to the press and said, Liz Strauss is an idiot. Forget about what she said. This is how we're going to do it. And that is what he should say. Not blaming Liz at the moment because she's been in power for only a very short period, but he also did not do it with her predecessors, right? Regardless of what idiotic things uh, they promised, and I gave you a number of examples uh, previously. Um, <clears throat> And there is a structural difference there between monetary policy, where we sort of all agree it should be independent and run by a strong person like Mark Carney, and power generation and electricity supply, which should also be run by an independent technocrat who has the balls to stand up to politicians. But that is not the case, right? But as I said, uh, Dermot is a very nice guy. Um, so, <laughs> in the short run, make sure you've got your candles, right? Um, the problem, the fundamental problem here is that politicians have been playing politics at the expense of energy policy. Um, really what we should have is the same as with monetary policy, that Parliament sets the targets for power generation. Energy should be reliable, it should be affordable, it should be clean. And at that point, government should step back politics should step back and say, we need an independent regulator that is competent and that can actually deliver on clean, affordable, uh, and reliable uh, energy. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>